all right peace to you ladies and gentlemen how are you now in today's video i just want to well i have a little bit of a list right here that i've written wrote down and it's just contrasting things that are seen as sins or wrongs in the modern world versus things that are sins in the quran and how different they are and how warped our worldview is nowadays and i'll just go through this list one by one and hopefully it gives you some things to ponder and reflect upon so the first thing is what one sin the thing that we're taught in the modern world that's not right to do is hurting people's feelings now even if what you're saying to them is the truth even if what you're saying is based in sound reason and judgment based on the word of god if you bother somebody if they find it unpleasant to hear those words coming out of your mouth it's seen as bad you're an insensitive person you're evil you're doing wrong and you can actually be criminally punished sometimes for certain hot topics if you relay the truth on those matters that's seen as a sin in the modern world whereas in the quran it's seen as a sin to not speak the truth no matter what the complete opposite now of course when we're conveying the truth to somebody let's say we're telling them that their religion is idolatrous i talk to christians all the time i tell them their religion is filled with idolatry they are ascribing a partnership to god by saying jesus is the son of god this is wicked of course we say it with grace we say it respectfully we say it with righteousness we say it with a good tone but we cannot hide the truth just because it hurts some people's feelings right at some point you get to a station where it's not you or the way that you presented the message that's the problem it's the message itself that's the problem it's the truth that the person is bothered by which they're unable to keep they're unable to accept it's just too much for them right so that is a quranic sin to not speak the truth no matter what and even God in the Holy Quran, he says that we have more right to fear him. We ought to fear God more than fear people. Whereas in the modern world, we're taught to fear people. We're taught to fear that people might take things the wrong way and be hurt. And we're some kind of criminal for doing that. So that's one modern sin versus Quranic sins. Modern sin is hurting people's feelings. Whereas in the Quran, the, the true sin is to not speak the truth no matter what. No matter how much flack you may get for it. Speak it respectfully, but say it nonetheless despite how badly it might be taken by people number two sin in the modern world is not regarding the equality of all peoples and specifically of men and women we're inculcated from day one to believe that men and women are equal that of course equal in value men need women women need men no problem but we're not equal in authority we're not equal in station and we're not equal in abilities that's for certain there are things men are better at there are things women are better at and to acknowledge this difference is a sin in the modern world from day one we are taught that men and women are equal even from how we're raised how the schooling goes where from five years old six years old in kindergarten grade one grade two we're in a classroom mixed with boys and girls both being taught the same things in the same ways the very society itself is built upon the foundations that men and women are equal in every single way and to profane that doctrine is a great sin indeed in the modern religion but in the quran it is i don't know if i could say it's a sin but it's a great falsehood and to spew falsehood is sin and it's, it's a falsehood to not acknowledge the difference between men and women god said he made the male and the female and they are not alike god also says in the quran that he created one a degree above the other he favored one god even made adam first he made adam first then from him he made his mate god first made adam and blew his spirit into him and then afterwards from that spirit which he blew into adam he derived the woman the woman is secondary she was made afterwards as a derivative of the man she has closeness to god insofar as she resembles the man but the man is truly the greatest creation of god and the woman has that again insofar as she resembles him right so to spew falsehood is sin in the quran and it's a great falsehood to say that men and women are the same or that they have the same abilities it's not true so that's the second sin of the modern world versus sin in the quran number three a sin of the modern world is to not be tolerant of everything right we are taught from day one to compromise on every single standard just because then again it goes back to the whole thing of not hurting people's feelings right we have to whether it's sodomy whether it's sexual degeneracy whether it's men pretending to be women and women pretending to be men we're taught this idea that we ought to tolerate and just be so long as it isn't directly affecting us in an overt way the person isn't coming and hurting me or 
beating me up or taking my money or anything like that. We ought to be accepting and loving and tolerant of it, no matter how delusional the idea is, which is, of course, ridiculous. And if you don't do that, if you stand firm on your beliefs on these matters and you, you don't compromise the truth for anything, then you're going to suffer in this world. You're going to suffer in the system for darn certain. They're going to paint you out as a sinner. Whereas in the Quran, it's the complete opposite. They, they tell you to be tolerant of everything. Of course, they're not tolerant of us. They're not tolerant of true conservatively minded believers. But just take that consist inconsistency aside. In the Quran, we are taught to have very, very strict boundaries, right? So it's the complete opposite. Not being tolerant and accepting of everything, but instead it's a sin to not have very strong restricted boundaries whereby we know clearly what is what right and what is wrong and we don't change our stance on that okay everything is informed by the scriptures god tell we are called to the most upright of behavior in terms of morality in terms of what we say in terms of how we conduct ourselves in the world in, in terms of what we accept right and this is uh something which will leave you in tension with the modern world you will have a lot of tension with the people around you if you have very strict and set boundaries which According to the Quran, having furqan, having a good judgment, having a good criterion by which you know what is good and what is bad. This, according to the Quran, is a great virtue, but it's a sin in the modern world. Number four, which is related to this, I don't know if it's, yeah, it is number four, is not being open-minded. Again, this goes back to the whole tolerant thing. We have to be tolerant of every last form of degeneracy and perversion and delusion that somebody can come up with. Whereas in the Qur'an, we are not to be open-minded, but instead we are to have firmly established and set beliefs that we don't compromise for anything or anyone. In the Qur'an, you know, God talks about the waverers, those who are neither here nor there in their doctrine. When good comes to them, then they change. Then when bad comes to them, they change again. God tells us to have very firm standards and beliefs, and we are not to change back and forth. This whole thing of being open-minded, I ought to listen to everybody's arguments about everything. Even totally delusional people like atheists, I ought to hear why they don't believe in God, why they don't believe in a creator. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. I don't care. I don't care one bit. If, if you, after all the evidence around you, the evidence of your own eyes and ears, you deny your creator, you have something deeply wrong with you. You are mentally shattered and damaged beyond belief, okay? You, you have severe psychological problems and you are being provoked by shaitans. And I have no interest in hearing atheist apologetics and why they don't believe in God and why they deny him. Not at all, because I'm not a waverer. I don't care. I stand upon the truth and God has revealed it, and I'm not going to hear anything that's going to bring any doubt or, you know, it's, it's going to make me question what is absolutely the truth, 100%. I'm not going to do that, right? God talks about the waverers. Again, they're neither here nor there. They're one way, then they're another way. They don't really have any firm set standards. And th these are people who are, in a sense, in some ways, too open-minded. We ought to be closed-minded and only following the truth which God has revealed and shut our minds off to all the rest of that nonsense which the world likes to fill your head with. So, not being open-minded, sin in the modern world, whereas not having strict, founded beliefs. That is a sin in the Quran. At least beliefs based in the truth. Number five, this one is a big one, is a not believing in science. That's a sin of the modern world. If you deny certain things that they say about human health, well, so-called health care, and the uh, Toyota Corolla, you deny the globe Earth, you deny the, uh, their theory, it's nothing but a theory that man evolved from some kind of primate-like creature. If you deny these sciences, so-called, at least falsely so-called, then you're a great sinner in the modern world. You're a maverick. You're a heretic. Right? Whereas in the Quran, the sin is not not believing in science, but not believing in scripture. If you don't believe the set down decrees of God, and you doubt them and you waver concerning them, that's a sin, and God will hold you accountable to it. It's a very clear and stark contrast between believing in falsely so-called science and believing in the word of God. Next one, this is a big one, number six is not relieving, this is a sin in the modern world, not relieving people of accountability for their suffering. So what I mean is, Mankind is very good at doing this. Mankind is very good at playing the victim and blaming other people for their problems. Everything nowadays is a disorder, a mental illness, like somebody's afflicted with something that's not their fault. And we're supposed to 
feel bad for them in some way and not acknowledge that their own sins have caused their suffering in their life. So you can think of, let's say, the homeless people, right? Most of these guys, it's by their own fault, their own sin. They've been unwise with spending. They've spent too much. They've involved themselves with bad people and bad habits. And this has caused them to be in the abject position they're in. Now, of course, in the Quran, we are called to help. If somebody's asking us for help, asking us for food, asking us for money, we try our best to help them. And if they seem incompetent, we at least try to feed and clothe them. If we don't feel like they're going to spend our money for good. But this whole idea of exonerating them of responsibility for the derelict life that they live. This, if you don't do that, then you're seen as a bad person. I don't feel bad for these people. I help them only because my Lord has given me the duty to help those who ask me and those who at least say that they're in need. I try my best to help them with what I can because my Lord has ordered me. But I don't feel bad for these people. Our suffering in our life is because of our own sin. Okay? Now, we will, even if we're good people, we'll be tested in life. No problem. God will test us and we need to remain patient. But I'm talking about these truly generally speaking, these truly life-destroying things where people are totally dysfunctional, down bad. They can't do anything, it seems, to make their circumstance better. That's your own sin causing that, okay? We are not victims. God says that corruption fills the land and sea for what the hands of men have earned, okay? God says he does not wrong his servants, but we wrong ourselves. God does not do any evil towards us, okay? Everything we have in our life, we've earned. Even with the uh, this, uh, like women, they, they, they don't want to be held, at least a lot of modern women, they don't want to be held accountable for the way they live their life. They'll oftentimes go to bad events, bad so-called parties, places where bad men are, on, and then there's intoxicants thrown into the mix, and something unfortunate happens to them. Let's say, I'm not, I don't want to use the word, because YouTube is going to ban me, but certain unconsensual or rather blurry consented sexual acts which women will complain about and they'll blame they'll bl and i'm not saying that isn't a crime that's a wicked and evil thing but the, 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 uh, what what these people are trying to do is exonerate themselves from their own sin i don't feel bad for you that that happened to you because you were frequenting and going to an event where such things take place you were going to an event of sin of shaitan and something shaitanic and bad happened to you so it's this whole thing of nothing anybody does is their fault. It's always some disorder. Oh, I'm depressed and I'm sad. I have all these psychological issues. It's not because I'm a godless degenerate living my life in sin and I've denied the creator and I've disobeyed his commandments and laws. Now my life is destroyed and I'm filled with all kinds of anxieties because I've allowed demons into my life. No, it's not because of that. It's because, oh, my mom abused me or my dad abused me and I have all this trauma I'm carrying and now, you know, people, they should give me free handouts. They should help me out in my life. At least uh, the societally, the government should give me all these free handouts and they should try to cater to and pander to my victimhood. This, if you don't acknowledge this mentality of victimhood and you allow people to be victims, you're a great sinner in the system. Whereas, in the Quran, the victimhood mindset is completely abhorred. Again, corruption fills the land and sea for what the hands of men have earned. God does not wrong his servants. We are not victims in life. Whenever something terrible, truly horrible, happens to you, you need to first consider, what did I do to be, first also think that this may be a test from the Most High, and that you need to be patient, but also think, what did I do that may have brought about this circumstance? People do not want to face accountability for the ways they live their life. This system is falling apart. People are depressed more than ever, they're sad more than ever, relationships are broken, Women, they go through you know, boyfriend after boyfriend after boyfriend. And then finally, when they reach the end of all this, they're so jaded. They're unable to attach themselves to another man. They, they have all these problems and they want to blame these men. Well, blame yourself. Blame yourself and not staying pure until marriage, which is what God has commanded. And a lot of us, we don't even realize how sinful our thoughts and our actions are, our sentiments, because modernity has lowered our standards so much. We have surrounded ourselves and filled ourselves with sin and shaitans. I mean, think of the thoughts that dominate most people's minds nowadays. Jealousy, envy, malignity, anger, unlawful anger, not truly just anger towards sin and evil, but unlawful, unrighteous anger towards somebody telling you the truth. 
All these things, these thoughts, these sentiments, they bring curses into the life of the believer and the non-believer as well. Because we don't realize, we, we don't stop to consider how we may be conducting our own life, the way we're thinking, the way we're doing things, the way we're applying ourselves and how we're applying ourselves and how this may be bringing the curse of God into our life. Many of us, many of us, even the believers, we have to sit down and reflect and ask ourselves, have we turned our own vain desires into a God? God talks about, he says, have you not considered he who takes as his own God, his own vain desire? A lot of us do that as well. We don't even realize it, but we're idolaters. We don't even realize it, but sin rules our life. Jealousy, malignity. I can think of so many guys that are jealous of other people's height, another man's build, another man's full head of hair, another man's income. Women as well, they look at each other's possessions and each other's physical constitution and they're jealous. Envy is a sin and it brings curses into the life of the person. So we have to stop and reflect, think to ourselves, what are we doing that may be bringing these unfortunate and dire circumstances into our life? Man is accountable for how he lives. And it reminds me even of, I don't know if any of you have watched Spider-Man 2, the original Spider-Man, which was probably, it's probably one of my favorite movies with Tobey Maguire. And I don't know if it was in Spider-Man 2 or 1 or 3, whichever one, but I remember he delivered a line and it touched me as a child. And it even sticks with me to this day where he says that we, and I'm going to paraphrase it, of course, that we are the sum of the choices that we made in our life. And we always have the choice to do what is right. It is our choices that lead to who we are. It is our choices that make us into the person that we are. And if only people were to think long and consider, they might start to uncover a lot of sins which they were not aware of in the first place. Right, so again, if you acknowledge, or if you don't buy into this whole victimhood mindset, you're a sinner in the modern world. Whereas in the Quran, actually blaming God or blaming other people for all of your problems, that in and of itself is a sin because we are to take responsibility for how we live our lives and our circumstance. Because God says again, he doesn't wrong his servants. The next one, a great sin, or at least something which is seen as folly in the modern world, is not going ahead and gaining knowledge and getting an education and going to post-secondary school. If you don't do that, people see you as ridiculous. Just go there and waste all of your time learning absolutely nothing so that you fill your head with all this nonsense and so that you can eventually exult at your knowledge and be like, oh, look at me and how smart I am and how overqualified I am. This has wasted so many people's lives, just decades and decades and thousands of dollars in debt, learning nothing. Whereas in the Quran, we're not taught to mentally masturbate all day in all these meaningless, intellectually stimulating activities. We are taught to go do good deeds. In the modern world, it's seen as folly. If you're, you're a fool, if you don't want to go to post-secondary education. Whereas in the Quran, you're seen as a fool if you sit around and do nothing and you don't go out and do practical good deeds in your life. I don't see that as a virtue in the Quran. I don't see it as a virtue of consistently studying things which bring you really no benefit in life. They are rather ineffectual subjects, but you become obsessed with them and preoccupied. And really, it comes out of the ego of the modern man. He wants to exult at his own supposed knowledge and feel like he's so smart. And, and it comes from this pride. Oh, look at me and my university degree. Look at my bachelor's. Look at my this. Look at my that. My all, all it is, it's just this big boasting project to fill yourself with this humanistic knowledge, to feel like you're smarter than you really are. Whereas in the Quran, it's the opposite. We're not taught to fill our heads with all this knowledge that really doesn't exist, which doesn't affect us in any way, and which is, let's be real, base and falsehood. We are taught to be practical. And actually, to say, if we have no knowledge of a matter, to say God knows best. God knows best. So that's one of the sins, the things that are seen as foolish in the modern world, to not seek out all this vain knowledge which is going to bring you no benefit. Whereas in the Quran, it's seen as a sin to exult at your own supposed knowledge of things which you really don't know and not do good deeds. We are supposed to be practical, down to earth. It's about what man does in his life. Next one is, and the final one, is not feeling bad for your enemies. So, of course, in the Quran, we are told, if our enemies, they do justice with us, we are to be just and good with them out of our prudent fear of God. But 
ge generally feeling remorse and sympathy for truly evil doing satanic wicked people who are persisting obstinately in their sin and trying to fight us and ruin our lives we are to feel bad for them we are to have mercy for them we are to put them in jail instead of execute them or release them because of their good behavior that's not what we get in the Quran it's not what we get in the Quran it's very clear that the believers they will be laughing at the wrongdoers on judgment day all those men and women who detracted who called you crazy who painted you out for being delusional for following the word of God and sticking true to his commands that they, they laughed at us in this life we will get revenge in the hereafter we will laugh at them on judgment day God even says that they're gonna, when they're burning in hell and they have no water no provision they're gonna say oh please Please send us down some of the provisions to the people in the garden. You know, I hope that God puts me in the garden and you as well if you're a good believer. But to those righteous men and women in the garden, they're going to be saying, Oh, please give us some of that water, some of that food, that enjoyable stuff that God is giving you. We're going to say, No, God has made it unlawful for you. There's going to be a gloat. There's going to be an enjoying of the suffering of evil doing people and the final dissolution of them in the Quran. And this is seen in the modern world as psychopathic, right? You're seen as crazy. But, you know, according to the Qur'an, we are to strive hard against evil. If our enemies are truly hell-bent, in the true sense of the word, hell-bent in fighting against the truth no matter what, and it, they show no signs of yielding or having mercy, we are to strive hard against them and not compromise ourselves. God says, kill the unbelievers wherever you find them. In matters of war, when they have no obligation for contract or loyalty or anything like that, kill them wherever you find them. And this is seen as evil. This is seen as bad. But in the Quran, it's a sin to not strive hard against evildoers and to compromise for them. So sin in the modern world is not feeling bad for your most worst enemies. Whereas in the Quran, it's bad to not strive against evil doing people. We will get the last laugh. I relish, I relish in the dissolution and suffering of my enemies. And people think I'm crazy for that. But again, it's just a deluded virtue signaling mentality of the modern world. They want you to be soft and weak and compromise for all of the bad things that they plan on bringing to you in your life and all of the evil and degeneracy they plan on promoting. They don't want you to stand firm against their sin. They don't want you to stand firm against their policies. And all this stuff is just there to soften you and make you weak. Whereas the Quran, it tells us the truth. God gives us a strength. He's given us game. It's just on us to acknowledge that and follow it through to the end, consistently and faithfully. But anyways, ladies and gentlemen, that's really all I got to say on the matter. I hope this talk was a blessing. And yeah, peace to you. Remember, you see it abound, so keep your eyes wide open. Peace out. Peace and blessings in the name of the Most High, viewer. My name is Walid Naim, and I am a zealous submitter to the one true God, the creator of all mankind. Do you notice something wrong with the world? Something strange? Despite us having a church, synagogue, and mosque in every neighborhood, how has this entire Western civilization fallen into abject atheism, nihilism, and savagery? Why does life just seem so dull, so meaningless, and so devoid of anything real in the Occidental world? Despite the ubiquitous presence of these religious institutions, why are our so-called Muslim sons in large numbers drinking, smoking, partying, and chasing after women, with no seeming desire to do anything more with their life other than satisfy their base pleasures when God has commanded them to be clean, righteous, and responsible leaders of their community? And why are our hijabi so-called Muslim daughters walking around with tight jeans that reveal their figure with TikTok accounts posting semi-provocative, self-absorbed videos of themselves online for the world to see when God has commanded them to lengthen their garments and be modest in their mannerisms. What has happened here? These young men and women are supposed to be making themselves right before God while raising the next generation of ardent defenders of the holy faith. But it seems that Islam features no more in their lives other than a scarf on their head, a Friday fidgeting around in the mosque when their parents force them to go against their will, or a decorative hanger in their car. At this rate, if God allows us to continue going down the road it is, then Islam and the Quran will become pretty much non-existent in the lives of most of our descendants, if it wasn't already non-existent now. If we do not take a stand soon, in a few generations, our children's children will likely be indistinguishable from the secular West. Is that the kind of world we want to live in? Our kids to live in? 
a world practically devoid of the remembrance of the one God and all things sane? I obviously can't speak for you, but for my own self, I can personally say, count me out of it. I'm not going to sit here and just watch my brothers and sisters, those who claim to believe in God alone, believe in Judgment Day, his prophets and angels, and all the other aspects of this holy creed get duped into going to hell. I'm not going to let this happen without at least something of an effort on my end to reroute this dark trajectory. So, again, how in the world do we end up here? There is a mosque in practically every neighborhood in the West, and no shortage of donations that get dropped in their boxes. They have had lots of funding, lots of time, and unquestioning support from their respective congregations, yet somehow have been run over by the secular atheist. All of their so-called Muslim children go to the atheist, secular public schools for most of their week to be taught beliefs that are completely incompatible with the Qur'an. And we wonder why they have ended up the way they are. If these houses, and by these houses I mean the mosques, were truly of God that were doing everything right, then why would our Lord let them get so decisively trampled upon by their enemies? Why do the wicked have all of the reins of power here? Clearly, something is not adding up. Well, it is my thesis here today that the vast, vast majority of mosques that exist in this world today have lost their way and follow a religion which is completely foreign to the Qur'an. This is why they have failed so miserably in the West, and it seems that God has forgotten them. In truth, the real reason behind their shortcoming is that they, and many of us, have forgotten God himself, which is why he has left us here collecting our bitter receipts. So, what are my exact criticisms of the mosques today? As a Muslim, and a man committed to the truth above all else, what are my personal gripes with their institution, which claims to be for God? The first glaring problem I can think of is that the majority of people who call themselves Muslim have allied themselves with a body of literature that is foreign to the word of God, treating it equal to and in fact above the Qur'an itself. Of course, I am talking about the Hadith. Listen, the facts are this. There is no justification within the Qur'an which tells us to follow this Hadith stuff, which came hundreds of years after the Prophet Muhammad died, and therefore he could have had no ability to oversee what people have said about him, and determine if it is true or false. It is now becoming crystal clear, especially in the last 10 to 20 years, that many, many things that have been ascribed to him in their most quote-unquote authoritative texts, which they call their Sahih Hadiths, are forgeries that directly contradict God's final revelation. To take these words of men, i.e. the Hadith, and hold them to be equally authoritative to the words of God would be breaking the first and most important commandment, which is to worship God alone, making no equals with him. To say that these supposed words of Muhammad, which are not even Muhammad's own words, but simply very doubtful rumors about what people who existed hundreds of years after him say he said, that have been decided upon by the scholars as authoritative holds equal or in fact any weight in our faith comparable to the verbatim words of God himself, the Holy Quran, is idolatry. You are exalting man's words to the status of divinity, which should only be given to God's words. Nothing comes even close to the Quran because God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is its author. This includes the Hadith too, which pales in comparison and is superfluous to the glorious Qur'an. If you are interested in seeing a full refutation of the Hadith, you may watch my video titled, A Defense of Prophet Muhammad, David Wood and Hadith Exposed, which is linked below. In it, along with refuting and putting in his place the worst opponent of Islam on the internet, Mr. David Wood, I also expose how the Hadith is completely contradictory to the Qur'an and the source of much of the Muslim world's problems. It is a two-hour-long documentary where I seek to demonstrate the true character of Muhammad in the Qur'an, defending his history and personality with primary source quotations. I clear the last prophet of God's name from the people who have tarnished his reputation the most, which are certain types of Christians, and, sad to say, hadith-following Muslims, which have said many terrible things about him. No, Muhammad was not a money-hungry, tyrannical warlord who married a six-year-old girl. He was a shy, humble, meek man who married adult women, had compassion for even his worst enemies, and oftentimes had a tough time even standing up for himself out of fear of hurting other people's feelings. This is all demonstrated in detail in my video. Once again, the link for that will be in the description under the tab, The True Character of Muhammad in the Qur'an. So that is the first problem with the mosques, the reason for which I feel they have been forsaken by God. 
their adoption of an apostate literature which contradicts their foundational scripture. The second point of contention I have with many of the mosques is their seeming unwillingness to say anything controversial which may make them face persecution from their government. The fact that 9-11 was not only an inside job, but the fact that no planes hit the Twin Towers on that day, and the whole charade was a hoax designed by the governments of the world to forever frame the Muslim people as terrorists and justify invasions in our countries, should be taught to every man, woman, and child. This great fraud of the September attacks has left such a lasting, enduring reputation on every brown person, and Muslim in general, that it should be discussed in every mosque. Our people are not responsible for that crime, but it was the governments of the world who carried out that plot and framed us for it. 9-11 is just only one small example, though. There are many, many other quote-unquote conspiracy theories, which are really just conspiracy facts, avoided by the mosques due to their controversy, like the fact that the monetary system in the West is an ungodly scam based on usury, the fact that the so-called healthcare system is a predatory empire which doesn't try to cure anybody but instead makes money off of human suffering, the fact that sodomite propaganda is being promoted to the masses, including our children, and the fact that the thing which I will call the C-19er, to avoid censorship, was a hoax perpetrated by the powers that be to greatly expand their police state, censorship incentives, and surveillance systems worldwide in order to create their new world order, and much more. These governments that have occupied our lands are de facto terrorist regimes, and the mosques seem to say nothing of it. They appear to be more concerned with not being labeled extremists while they live their comfortable, well-funded lives, avoiding topics that are hard to deal with due to the abject persecution they bring. That is my second problem with them. Their, at the very least, lack of awareness, or if not, perhaps lack of willingness to address the real geopolitical situation going on in the world. And lastly, my third trouble with the mainstream mosques, which can also be put into the category of conspiracy facts, is their complete ignorance on the true nature of the earth. It may sound as a shock to you, my viewer, that the Quran, the Bible, and in fact all of the ancient scriptures teach the earth is flat and stationary. This is the only model of the world which is compatible with those texts, and also scientifically provable. This flat earth conspiracy, which should really be called the globe earth conspiracy, is one of the biggest lies of the modern world we are told, and goes in line with what I said earlier about the endemic corruption of the governments of the world. Everything you have been told about where you live is a fabrication, and the space agencies are a shameless hoax. For a fully detailed presentation on the subject of Flat Earth, where I demonstrate the science, the history, the philosophy, the verses in the Bible and Quran proving it, and much more, you can read my book titled The Flat Earth Manifesto, which is linked in the description. This work runs to nearly 1,200 pages and is practically a textbook on not only the topic of Flat Earth, but the subject of physics proper, and I expose the biggest fraudulent religion of the West, which is science worship, otherwise known as scientism. As with all of my work, it too is available for free. No, you do not live on a pathetic speck of dust spinning around in the middle of nowhere in space. You live in a brilliant, intelligently designed terrarium created by God and are at the center of the universe. Again, to learn more, the link to the Flat Earth Manifesto will be in the description. Those right there are my three biggest scores against the mosques of today. There are more points I could bring up, but these are the major ones. These are the controversies which have estranged me from the rest of the so-called Muslim world. Believe me when I say that I would love to join them and that it hurts me so deeply that I have to pit myself up against the very institution I was born and raised in, the mosques I attended from childhood whose carpets upon which I walked, stood, prayed, and listened to the preaching in my earliest years. But that is the price to pay for the truth. My commitment to God and what is right is more important than my emotional attachments to a place that was once dear to my heart. Simply put, this is why I think God has forsaken us. This is why I think that the mosques have been steamrolled by the secular atheist. It is because most of us have abandoned the word of God, neglected preaching the truth, and instead chosen comfort over courageous action. That is my thesis to why this great falling away in the West has taken place. If this sounds shocking to you, if it sounds so unbelievable that the majority of the so-called Muslim world could be deceived so badly, then I simply have these verses in the Quran to show you. In the name of God, the Almighty and the Merciful. Chapter 6, verse 116. 
And if thou obey most of those upon the earth, they will lead thee astray from the path of God. They follow only assumption, and they are only guessing. Chapter 25, verse 30. And the messenger will say, O oh my Lord, my people took this Quran as a thing abandoned. God has really predicted this a millennia ago. He knew that the people who follow what is really right are few and far between, that the majority of men and women are led astray, and the people who claim to love Muhammad the most, i.e. mainstream Muslims, would abandon the glorious Quran. God has revealed to us a thousand years ago that this all would be the case. It is my mission, therefore, by the will of God, to band together with like-minded believers who have understood the truth and work together to build a new institution from the ground up, founded upon prudent fear. We need to start fresh, start anew. We need to build a new mosque where people can hear the unfiltered preaching from the Quran alone, where men and women can get married, where children can play and be educated in the truth, and where the name of the Most High God, without any associate partners, can be remembered. We need a group of highly dedicated men who will raise and defend this institution with their own hands if need be and go out into the world warning people of the punishment of God, bearing witness to the truth of his oneness. That is my mission, my viewer. If you found that this mission of mine has touched your heart and is something you want to get involved with, then feel free to contact me in the email below. I am located in Ontario, Canada, and I'm looking forward to form a community with like-minded believers who want to contribute to this great cause. I am neither a nationalist nor racially biased. If you follow the Quran alone and believe in the truth, then as far as I'm concerned, you are my brother in the faith. I prefer you over someone of my own kindred who denies God and commits corruption in the earth. My loyalties are primarily ideological, not racial. Remember, my viewer, that this life is short. Everything we do and don't do is recorded by God and will either bear witness for us or against us on the day of judgment. Hell is eternal, and I do not know about you, but as for me, I want to meet my creator in the best state possible. I want to spend my life struggling to build up my people, the true Muslims, so that God may be pleased with me on that day. If you are interested in that, then feel free to join me. If not, then find something else good to do which will prepare you for your appointment with the Most High. That is where we are all going anyway. With that being said, I say peace and God bless to all of you good people. Take care, everyone.